based on your professional scientific investigations over a long period of time, when it comes to climate change, what is the real story? Climate change is probably the defining challenge of the 21st century. You know, and until recently, it was reasonable to assume that Earth was so big and complicated that human actions probably couldn't change it. But now there's so many people, we have so much technology, that it's clear that, that we're changing the planet in fundamental ways, a, a wide range of ways of which changing the climate is only one. But there's no question that humans have changed the composition of the atmosphere. We've increased the concentration of the main heat-trapping gas, carbon dioxide, by more than 40% over the last 100 years. Um, the expectation is that those changes will continue on a very rapid pace unless we decrease emissions of these heat-trapping gases. And there's, there's no question scientifically that an increase in the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere causes climate change. We now have a very high level of confidence that the warming we've seen over the last 50 years or so has been predominantly caused by these greenhouse gases that have been emitted as a result of human activities. Automobiles, factories. Basically, the sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere from human activities are a combustion of fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and natural gas as an energy source, a clearing of forests, which contributes around 10% of the CO2 to the atmosphere, uh, all of the processes that release methane or natural gas, and, and that includes not only petroleum exploration and, and leaks from the natural gas system, but it also includes many agricultural processes, uh, including uh, cattle rearing, ship rearing, and it also um, is, is produced in wetlands, especially rice paddies. And then an uh, additional source of important greenhouse gases is, is a, a very powerful greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide, which is mainly a waste product from fertilizer applications. So application of too much fertilizer releases this powerful heat trapping gas to the atmosphere. Looking forward, what we see is that we have a range of different possible futures. If we think about a future of continued high emissions of greenhouse gases, continued emphasis on these fossil energy sources, we'll probably end the 21st century at a temperature level that's somewhere between 6 and 10 Fahrenheit warmer than pre-industrial. That's a huge amount of temperature difference, and it's a temperature difference where we would see a massive effects of the high temperatures and heat waves. We would see large effects on the redistribution of precipitation, a, a large amount of sea level rise, and a, a large change in where different kinds of human activities could occur. There'd be impacts on agriculture, impacts on ecosystems, and impacts on economic activities. On the other hand, uh, we could also have a future where we do ambitious efforts to decrease the amount of greenhouse gases that are released to the atmosphere. With ambitious efforts, we might end the 21st century at a level of warming that's maybe three to five degrees higher than pre-industrial conditions. And that would be an amount of warming that was in some ways comparable uh, to the amount of warming we saw from 1900 to now, or from now to the end of the century, that much again. And there'd be important consequences to that, especially in places where people or activities are particularly vulnerable. But that's mostly a level of climate impact that could be managed with careful investments in adaptation and making sure that people, societies, and ecosystems are as well prepared as possible. Now let's talk about what we don't know. What are the most important things that we do not know about climate change? So there are lots of nuances that we don't know about the pathway on which the future climate will unfold. Uh, as an example, we know that many areas in the polar regions that have permanently frozen soils are beginning to thaw. Uh, many of those permanently frozen soils have large amounts of organic matter. The specialists in this area often describe it as similar to frozen broccoli. And when you take the broccoli out of the freezer, it thaws and decomposes rapidly. Uh, that organic matter is made of carbohydrates that when they decompose, release CO2 to the atmosphere. And sometimes they release methane to the atmosphere depending on the conditions under which they decompose. So we do not know how rapidly 
thawing of permafrost is going to result in a vicious cycle feedback that pumps more heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. We do not know how great the risk is that decreases in rainfall in the world's tropical forests will convert those forests from basically inflammable, no forest fires ever, to highly flammable so that we lose those forests and all the carbon in them, which is hundreds of billions of tons, is released to the atmosphere as heat trapping gases. Uh, we don't know how rapidly the major ice sheets might be destabilized. If you look at all the ice that's sitting on Greenland, and that's an amount of ice if it were all melted and put in the oceans, would amount to between 20 and 25 feet of sea level, vast amount. The calculations indicate that at warming somewhere between two and probably seven degrees, we're committed to irreversible loss of that ice sheet. But we don't know if it's closer to the two degrees or closer to the seven degrees uh, in the context of where we've already seen more than one degree of warming. So you can think about it as a tipping point or a trigger that is out there that we're in the crosshairs of, but we don't know exactly where it is. There are some people who look at this issue and say, listen, we're too far gone, we're doomed. The others who say, listen, it's vastly overstated and uh, we're kind of nonchalant about the whole thing. As far as you're concerned, what is the correct level of concern? Managing climate change is challenging managing risks. We know that some climate changes have already occurred, and we know something about the impacts associated with those. We know many things about the way climate is likely to change with future emissions, but we don't know exactly what the impacts will be. Some things we can project based on historical experience, some things on models, but if you really look at the kinds of factors that disrupt societies, they're usually these kind of unpredictable combinations of things, and they often depend on outcomes that involve many different sectors of society. For example, if there's civil unrest that combines with a drought, that combines with a, a, a drought someplace else that causes a spike in agricultural processes, you know, complicated, difficult to predict outcomes that really need to be managed in the context of understanding the risks. And it's important to recognize that we don't know exactly what the impacts of climate change will be, but what we do know is that the risk of those impacts goes down dramatically as the amount of climate change goes down. And so instead of taking a perspective that says, okay, we can with precision say the optimal amount of climate change is, you know, 3.1 degrees, what we can really say is that we can provide, as a global community, a much higher level of protection and a much more open path to a vibrant future if we limit the risks from climate change by limiting the amount of warming that occurs. Well, there's a lot of skepticism about this. Where do you come out on that? You must hear people from time to time say, sure. listen, Professor, I, I hear what you're saying and it's very impressive, but I gotta tell you, I think in the great sweep of history uh, that this climate change danger is being vastly overestimated, for example. One of the things that I see is people being skeptical about climate change and about the, the need to take steps towards solutions for a number of different reasons. Some people just feel that the earth is so big that humans could, could never possibly change it. Sometimes that comes from a um, religious or philosophical perspective. Sometimes the skepticism comes from concern that, well, if we have to spend money solving this problem, maybe it'll decrease economic growth, maybe it'll leave more people in poverty, maybe it'll foreclose on economic opportunities. But the people who make that argument often aren't looking at the big picture. They're not looking at what are the opportunities for economic growth in a world that has more climate extremes or that have extreme events that disrupt uh, economies and societies. The other thing that's important is that solving the climate problem uh, doesn't have to be a um, massive redirection of resources. We need to spend huge amounts of money on energy infrastructure over the next 50 years regardless. 
and the real risk of taking a skeptical approach and saying, well, let's wait until we know exactly what the problem looks like, uh, then we're in an environment where we need to transition so quickly that we can't do it efficiently. It costs way more to wait and act suddenly than to act incrementally, thoughtfully, and wisely starting now. You know, the example that's relevant here is the risk of a terrorist attack. You don't know that a terrorist attack is coming. If you took the skeptic's approach, you'd say, well, uh, since I don't know that a uh, terrorist attack is coming, I won't do anything. Uh, but in fact, we have a lot of information that says precautionary action is well advised. And that's risk management, and that's what we need to do in managing the risk of climate change. This may be a diversion, but keep in mind I'm a Texan the son of an oil field worker who was the son of an oil field worker and I worked in the oil fields and pipelines in my youth. I run across people all the time say, Dan, you talk to these high-powered professors, you talk to these leading scientists, and they talk about it. great changes coming, but with modern technology, there's so much oil and gas still to be dug that things are not going to change that much. We're going to be dependent on oil and gas for the foreseeable future, no matter what your professional friends tell you, Dan. What am I to say to them? Let me say two things. Uh, the, the first is that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the Petroleum Age is not going to end because we run out of petroleum. And there's a vast amount in the ground. Uh, but, you know, if you say, oh, things never change that fast in the fossil energy business, just look at the emergence of horizontal drilling and fracking. The, the gas industry is just dramatically different than it was only a decade ago. Sure. People never thought that you would be able to break up these tight rock formations and extract the gas. I mean, I think that technology has a way of opening some very compelling opportunities if you just let the creativity of the business sector uh, figure out what can be done, and, and I would love to see an opportunity for there to be financial investments, financial opportunities from carbon capture and storage, similar to the kind of financial opportunities that led to the development of the fracking technologies. But part of it you said, look, we, we need to take certain steps. Right away somebody's going to say, ah, big spender, you want to spend more money, spend more taxpayer dollars on this some would say uh, purely hypothetical thing. That, that's a charge that's going to be put. Anybody who says, any politician, that's a difficult sell in today's electoral reality. Yeah, you know, the, the question of where the money comes from and that has a whole bunch of dimensions. If you look worldwide, we probably spend more than half a trillion dollars a year, more than $500 billion a year in subsidies to fossil energy interests simply removing those subsidies, so this is saving money, not, not spending more, but spending less, would go a long way toward leveling the playing field so that the non-emitting technologies have more of a fighting chance for getting into the market. And what we're really talking about is a repositioning. Um, George Schultz, former Secretary of State, has been an outspoken advocate for what he calls a revenue-neutral carbon tax based on the well-established idea that if you want to see behaviors change, you tax the things you want to see less of and you don't tax the things you want to see more of. If you think about a revenue neutral carbon tax, you would tax income less because you want people to be able to aspire to have their income and use it. Uh, you tax carbon more because we're trying to transition people away from carbon intensive energy systems into renewables. Uh, that's a, a perfect example of a way to think about a strong incentive that would not in fact increase government spending at all. It would simply reposition uh, where the investments were coming from and where they were going. You know, I think what we need are solutions that bring forward the best ideas and the best application of technologies and capital that the world can come up with. Uh, free markets have been a remarkably successful way to do that. And I would argue that if you step back and say, well, what are we really talking about 
when we're talking about solving the climate problem, we're creating what may be the um, biggest economic opportunities of the second half of the 21st century. It may be a different set of players in the leading companies, and just as the leading companies of 2015 aren't exactly the same as the leading companies of 1950. But the energy system operates at dramatic scale. It's going to require dramatic investments and represent dramatic returns to the players who are successful in it.